Hello friends. So today I'll be just giving a nice overview on hepatopulmonary syndrome. Um, I gather this was asked as a DRNB question. So it's good for all the trainees to have clarity. It's a simple topic, but uh, of, of course, when they ask for an exams, you need to answer the key components that is expected out of you on hepatopulmonary syndrome. So I wish to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Dr. Mega, who helped me develop this content. And we have published a article as a video tutorial on this hepatopulmonary syndrome. I'll show you that article. So hepatopulmonary syndrome, as the so, yeah. name sounds, so liver is involved, lung is involved. So the whole characterization and the problem of hepatopulmonary syndrome lies at this level, at the pulmonary vasculature. So for all the trainees, pay attention in exams if they ask, just put this as a pictorial depiction. So this is a normal pulmonary vasculature where you have a pulmonary artery coming here and then the pulmonary vein. So the deoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood going back into the left atria and so on and so forth. So this is a normal. So in hepatopulmonary syndrome, so there is dilatation of these pulmonary vasculatures that tends to happen. Most importantly, picture speaks thousand words. So you have these right to left shunt happens. So you have this extra pulmonary vessels that happens and there is this right to left shunt that happens. So there is more of deoxygenated blood which gets drained into the toxigenated blood and there is hypoxemia that sets it. So this is, so there is this sort of a VP shunts you can call. So there are uh, AV, sort of not VP, so uh, AV sort of a shunting that happens. So there is right to left shunt that happens at the pulmonary vasculature level. So initially, the even the, the the types of HPS is based on the severity of these collaterals that happen or the right to left shunts that develop within the lungs that tends to happen determines the severity of hepatopulmonary syndrome. So initially, there will be more of dilatation of the pulmonary vasculature and then these shunts develop. So essentially, this is what happens in hepatopulmonary syndrome. So if you keep this picture in your mind, you'll be able to reproduce this better in exams. And the way to diagnose this is by doing contrast enhanced echocardiogram, which, and that is what we published, like we had to do agitated saline test. And we have published a video tutorial on that in uh, Journal of Acute Care. Or you can do a lung perfusion scan. And in lung perfusion scan, the shunt fraction has to be more than 6% to call it as hepatopulmonary syndrome. So when you look at uh, sort of uh, the key components of pulmonary uh, uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome, as you see, there is a liver disease and there is this pulmonary vasculature dilatation and there is oxygenation. So these are the three components in the hepatopulmonary syndrome. So there is an underlying liver disease, then there is a pulmonary vasculature dilatation and the VP shunts that develop, not VP, so it's the right to left shunt and oxygenation defects that happen, so which leads to hypoxemia. And 5 to 32 percent is the sort of occurrence rate of hepatopulmonary syndrome. And it is shown that the severity of these shunts that develop in the lung not necessarily correlates to the severity of the underlying liver disease. So it can be fairly independent. It can be mild liver disease presenting with severe HPS, moderate liver disease presenting with HPS or severe. So the severity of cirrhosis does not determine the severity. There is no linear correlation of severity of the underlying liver disease and the hepatopulmonary syndrome. So what are the diagnostic criteria? So there are diagnostic criteria. So PaO2 less than 80 at room air in patients with underlying liver disease or you have a AA shunt, alveolar arterial oxygen gradient, more than 15 millimeter mercury. We, one can consider it as a possibility. In more than 65 years, this AA thing should be more than 20 millimeter mercury. So this is the baseline sort of a criteria you can keep in mind. So there is a grading, severity grading. Mild is where you have PaO2 more than 80 or AA more than 15. Moderate is so very easy to remember, but in exams, obviously, we would be expected to at least write this. It's very simple. Moderate 60 to 79. AA remains the same, more than 15. Severe is more than 15. Very severe is where even on ventilator, if I to 100%, PF ratio is less than 300 or PO2 less than 50 with AA more than 15. So this is the severity. Mild, moderate, severe and very severe is the classification of severity of uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. So the, the pathophysiology is something that we can nicely try to understand in a pictorial way. Um, and most pathophysiologically, if you see 
the problem starts from the endothelium. So this endothelium, endothelium of the vessels, they release this endothelium. And this endothelium produces nitric oxide synthase. And that produces nitric oxide. And we all know the whole problem starts there. Once nitric oxide gets produced, there is vasodilatation. So very simple. So there is pulmonary vascular dilatation. There is right to left shunt. And for this dilatation, you need to have an element. And that element is nitric oxide. And that comes from the vascular endothelium producing. So very intuitive for all our intensive care trainees to put this pathway when this is asked as an exam. And this leads to vasodilatation. And there is a VP mismatch that tends to happen. So this is the basic sort of a pathophysiological and inducible nitric oxide synthase are also produced by inflammatory cells. Always remember in sepsis or take any ICU conditions, this pathway is something you can keep in mind. Always nitric oxide has some role to play because nitric oxide basically acts on the vessels and leads to vasodilatation, your hypotension, all that happens. And this uh, INOS or inducible nitric oxide synthase or inhibitory nitric oxide synthase uh, basically are produced by inflammatory cells also and uh, there is this activated macrophages or monocytes which produce tumor necrosis factor alpha and uh, this uh, tu tumor uh, necrosis factor alpha leads to activation of this INOS, nitric oxide synthase sort of an activation. So more nitric oxide gets produced and more vasodilatation happens. So this is the pathophysiological. So there is a lot of this shunt fraction that tends to develop in the lung. And the third, so the two mechanisms is one is nitric oxide excess production by the vascular endothelium, by the inflammatory cells, TNF, activating the nitric oxide synthase. In the lungs, it is shown that the heme gets degraded. The heme gets degraded by heme oxygenase and produces carbon monoxide. And this also leads to vasodilation. This is the third pathway, which they have hypothesized as the cause for all this vasculature dilatation and shunts that happen. And they found all these elements because there is vasodilatation, there is a lot of neogenesis or the uh, there is a lot of vascular endothelium neogenesis that happens. And there is a lot of sprouting of these blood vessels that also leads to a lot of uh, vasodilatation and other uh, sort of a vascular uh, problems in uh, heptopalmary syndrome. So there is vascular neogenesis that tends to happen that also leads to increase in the shunt fraction. So if you remember this picture, that pretty much summarizes to you on the key components of the pathophysiological aspects. And there are two types, again, very simple, very intuitive. There is type 1 HPS and type 2. Type 1 is where there is only vascular dilatation. So type 1 is where there is, as you see, there's predominantly pulmonary vasculature dilatation due to all the pathophysiological. Type 2 is where you have this right to left shunt, which is predominantly present. And type 1 tends to respond to simple oxygen because it is in an early state. That's all. It just means there is vascular dilatation, but there's no shunt fraction that has set in. Type 2 is where you have this typical shunt fraction and there is this drainage of these shunts into oxygenated blood and hypoxemia does not get corrected with oxygen because you give oxygen also, it does not get corrected. Very simple, very intuitive. And uh, another important thing, when there is hepatopulmonary syndrome, you have to look at it as a whole conundrum involving various organs. Because there is a lot of shunt fraction, there is a lot of proto-systemic shunting, the risk of gut translocation, bacteremia and infection also tends to increase, which we know in liver disease, there is proto-systemic shunts that happen within the liver and there is a lot of gut translocation that happens. That's why they are at a risk for developing SBP, so on and so forth. And that tends to prevail even in head pairs. So very intuitive for all our intensive care trainees, you know, these are the things that tends to happen. So these are the types of HPS. Clinical features. Fairly intuitive again. So clinical features, it can be asymptomatic. Patient can remain nicely hypoxemic or patient can have dyspnea. But there is a key clinical feature, which I'm sure most trainees should know, is orthodeoxia. And there are signs and symptoms of underlying. So very intuitive. Na? In the exams, you can write, they can be asymptomatic, they can have dyspnea and the signs and symptoms of liver disease. But the key aspect which possibly you should remember in HPS is orthodeoxia. Uh, so that is platypnea, which we say. Very important, uh, very surprisingly, when they're supine, the oxygen levels are down. So when they're flat, oxygen levels are better, which sort of beats our regular ICU patients. And there is a way to diagnose this. So when you, when the patient is lying down, there is a nice oxygen. When they sit up, there is a desaturation that happens. And we have seen this in our ICU. So the fall in PO of more than 5% or more than 4 millimeter mercury after they sit up, 
is one of the clinical sign that you can look at as uh, uh, as one of the elements that you use in establishing the diagnosis of HPS. So these are the simple clinical features. And uh, but although this test has a low sensitivity, but it tends to increase with severity. If patient has a severe hepatopulmonary syndrome, and this characterization of orthodeoxia, where when they sit up, they they sort of desaturate, tends to get worsen with the severity of hepatopulmonary syndrome. So this is something you can remember. So how do we go about diagnosing? So obviously, uh, arterial blood gas will show some sort of a hypoxemia due to a lot of right to left shunts that happen. So this is the test that you can adopt to look at right to left shunt that are multiple shunts that are there in the lung can be ascertained by this agitated saline test. Uh, and we have done it and we have published this. So basically you take two syringes. In one syringe, you take one ml of air and another syringe, you take nine ml of air, put a three way and you keep flushing in and out. So there is sort of bubbles that form, micro bubbles. So that leads to agitated saline test. And I see these sort of a micro bubbles get seen in the LA and LV, which means they have entered the pulmonary circulation into the pulmonary veins and into the LA. And you can see all these bubbles. So this is the agitated saline test. And we did it in our own ICU. So you can see this picture. So, so you can carefully see, you'll see the bubbles that come in. This is done in our own patient. You can see that bubbles. So that white thing you see. So you can see, these are all the agitated saline bubbles that have come into the LA and LV. That is very pathognomonic of uh, sort of a shunts that are prevailing. You can see that, friends. I'll show you again. Okay, so you saw that. Okay. And this is the publication we did, bubble test for diagnosis of hepatopulmonary syndrome. And uh, so there are other tools that you can use. So generally, when you do bubble test, if you look into the literature, transesophageal echo is touted to be superior to transthoracic echo in identifying those bubbles. And of course, you can do lung perfusion scan. As I said, shunt fraction should be more than 6%. So if you have a radionuclide facilities, this perfusion scan is something that can be done. And pulmonary angiogram can be done to look into the severity and ascertain the degree of... Uh, right to left shunts that are prevailing and CT scans are basically done to rule out any other underlying lung pathology that may be prevailing and uh, lung function test, pulmonary function test shows impaired diffusion. So diffusion of carbon monoxide in the lung will be diminished. So diffusion numbers, if you do, if you do the diffusion capacity, DLCO will be reduced in PFT. So these are some of the tools that you can use as an adjunct to confirm the diagnosis of uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. And what about treatment? Treatment is only symptomatic, so you, one has to supplement them with oxygen. There is no medical treatment uh, that uh, that can fix this hepatopulmonary syndrome because it's a progression of the underlying liver disease which manifests with multiple photosystemic shunts that develop. And liver transplant is the only definitive tool to sort of fix this problem. And uh, people have contemplated on doing tips, limited data on the usefulness of tips. And uh, in an extreme measures, they have tried to coil a big shunts. There may be a big sort of a right to left shunts and they have tried to coil this. This is more as a desperate measure, but liver transplant always remains as the definitive tool. What is the prognosis? When you compare cirrhosis of liver or underlying CLD with HPS and no HPS, patients with HPS have higher mortality. They have twice. So it's two times that of mortality in patients who has HPS as compared to ones with no HPS. And any patient with HPS, intuitively, we know they're hypoxemic. They cannot do their daily activities. So quality of life would be poor. And mortality tends to increase with the severity of hepatopulmonary syndrome. So the more severe. So if it is in type 1, maybe they live a little longer. But once they go into type 2 with multiple right to left shunt, then the hypoxemia tends to prevail and it gets worse. And mortality obviously will be much higher. And liver transplant. Even in patients with HPS who undergo liver transplant, survival has shown to be not as good as someone who does not have HPS. So that is something which is little uh, disappointing or uh, disillusioning. That if someone has HPS, they go to transplant, their survival tends to be lesser than the other ones who have undergone liver transplant without uh, hepatopulmonary syndrome. So that's all folks on HPS. So very simple topic, but when asked as a question, at least you can categorize into these dimensions and have a little clarity on the pathophysiological aspects.
and uh, and the types and the severity if you write that i think that should fetch you full marks so thank you folks thank you one and all so i request you all to submit your valuable work to a journal of acute care of course you can visit my website to re to this lecture thank you thank you one and all